Hey there, fellow developers. Today, we will be diving into the cross-server matchmaking system in Roblox. Specifically, the one versus one matchmaking, where two similar level players will be matched up and teleported to a reserved server. I'll do my best to explain how the system works. However, having a basic understanding of Roblox scripting is necessary to grasp its functionality. You need to understand how memory store service, messaging service, and teleport service work. So, let's see how this system will work. Think of the memory store as a folder. This folder will contain all the queues. The queues, which is a table data, are also works like folders. And name of the folder is the key that will help us to find the queue in the memory service. Now, in the queue, we will save the data of players who are in the queue as a table. That table will contain the player's user ID. And their level, which will be used for player matching. Now, when a player joins the queue, there are three possible scenarios. The first scenario is when the game fails to retrieve the queue from the memory store. Although the chances are low, it's not zero. In this case we will just tell the player to try again later. The second scenario occurs when the game successfully retrieves data, but there's no actual queue stored in memory. This happens because the data stored in the memory store service isn't permanent and will vanish upon reaching the maximum lifetime. However, there's no need to worry as every time a player joins or leaves the queue, it resets the data's maximum lifetime. Data stored in the memory service can last up to 45 days. Essentially, if no player interacts with your game until the lifetime limit is reached, the queue will be deleted due to lack of activity. It's kinda sad, because no one's playing your game. In these cases, we simply create the queue and insert the player's data into it. The third scenario occurs when the game successfully retrieves data from the memory store and finds the queue. Then, the game will iterate through the data of every player in the queue to find a player with a matching level. If it doesn't find a match, it simply inserts the new player's data into the queue. If it finds a player with a matching level, it first removes the data of the matching player. Then, using the teleport services reserve server function, it generates a reserve server and returns an access code. Now, we'll create a table of data using both players' user IDs and access codes. Finally, using the messaging service, we instruct all servers in the game to check if either of those players are in them. If found, they are teleported to the reserve server using the access code. However, there's still a problem as the messaging service doesn't support sending table type data directly. Hence, we need to use the HTTP services JSON encode function to encode the table. Now that we have a basic understanding of how it will work, let's proceed to creating the system. Firstly, we need to publish the game. After that, we need to add another place where players will be teleported. To do this, go to the Asset tab. Select places. Then right click and add a new place. Now, add a script to the server script service. Firstly, let's retrieve all the services and store them in a local variable.
Now, let's create a sorted map in the memory service and name it QStore. This sorted map will work like the folder that holds all the other Q folders, such as 1 vs 1, 2 vs 2, 4 vs 4, etc. Now, let's add three remote events in the replicated storage and name them, join, leave, and teleport. Also, create three variables for each of them. Now, let's create a function that detects when a player joins the game. It will create a folder called leaderstats and insert a number value called level. While naming the folder leaderstats isn't necessary for the matchmaking to work, it allows us to see the level in game. Let's give it a go. And now we can see the level on the right top corner. Let's create the buttons to join and leave the queue. Next, we'll insert a local script and create variables for the events. We'll then detect when the player presses the join button and fire the join remote event. Additionally, we'll make the join button invisible and the leave button visible. Now, let's go back to the server script and detect when the join remote event fires, connecting it to a function. Firstly, we'll obtain the player's user ID and player level. Next, we retrieve the queue from the memory store. We'll enclose it in a P call, just in case something goes wrong and we don't want the whole script to break. The pcall function returns two values. Success, indicating if it worked fine, and result, which returns the queue when success is true. If success is false, it returns the error that caused the failure. Now, using the getAsync function, we will obtain the queue, which takes the key as its parameter. In my case, the key is 1v1. As I mentioned earlier regarding the possible scenarios of retrieving the queue from the memory store, Let's first handle the situation where we successfully retrieved the queue, but there isn't any actual data. This means the success value is true, but result is nil. In this case, we will create a queue and upload it to the memory store. Let's create a table. And inside that table, we will create another table with the player's user ID as its index. This will help us find the player's data easily later on when the players leave the queue. Now, inside that table, we will add the user ID and the level. However, there is another problem. Since we used the player's user ID as an index, which is a number, some players might get prioritized over others. For example, if a player with user ID 1010 is in the queue and a new player joins with user ID 1009, keeping the index as a number would put the new player in front of the previous player. This is unfair and might cause longer wait times for some people. To avoid this, we will make the index a string. Now, let's upload the new queue to the memory store. Make sure to enclose this function in a p call. The setAsync function takes three parameters, the key, the value, and the duration. I will create a local variable for the duration since we need to use it more than once. I'll set the duration to 24 hours or 86,400 seconds. Now, let's print out the results to make it easier to debug in the future. Now, let's handle the second scenario where we successfully retrieved the queue and there is data, meaning success is true and result isn't nil. In this case, we will iterate through the queue to find a player with a similar level. When we find a matched player, we will remove that player's data from the queue and upload it back to the memory store. We'll save the player's data table in a local variable and break through the loop. 
After the loop, we will check if the matched player variable is nil or not. If not nil, that means a match was found. And we will create a table data with the user IDs of the two players and the reserve server code using the teleport services reserve server function. This function takes the place's ID as its parameter. To get the place ID, go to the assets tab, select places, right click on the place, and then copy the ID to the clipboard. Next, we need to encode this data table using the HTTP services JSON encode function. After that, we are ready to publish this message using the messaging service. We will also enclose this in a P call. The messaging services publish async function takes two parameters, the topic, which works like a key, and the message. Following that, we will print out the results. Now, let's handle the scenario where we fail to retrieve the queue. Let's first create a text label that will inform the player that something went wrong and to try again. We will make it invisible. After that, go back to the local script. Instead of directly making the leave button visible, we will wait for the server's response. Let's create a local variable that will hold the response event and assign it to the join remote event function. We will receive a message from the server. After receiving the response, we need to disconnect the function because it is not needed anymore. I forgot to show it in the video but this is how it is done. Following that, we will check what the message is. If it is an error, we will make the error text label visible. Wait for one second, then make the text label invisible again and make the join button visible. If the message is a success, we will wait for a bit and then make the leave button visible. Now, go back to the server script. In the if statements where success is true, we will respond with a success message and an error message where success is false. I forgot to mention the part where the match player isn't found. In this case, we can simply insert the player into the queue and upload it back to the memory store. Now, we will teleport the players. First, we will get the message from the messaging service and decode it. After that, we will create a teleport option and set its reserve server access code property to the reserve code. Following this, we will loop through every player in this server and check if their user ID is the same as either of the two players in the message. If it is the same, then using the teleport services teleport async function, we will teleport them to the reserve server. If the teleport was successful, we tell the client that it is being teleported by using the teleport remote event. Let's create a blur effect and turn it off. After that, the client will listen to the event and enable the blur effect. Let's also create a text label. Now, for the leave button, the client side code is exactly the same as the join button. I'll just copy paste the code and change the variables.
Now, for the server script, we will first retrieve the queue. Then, using the player's ID as an index, we will check if the player's data is in the queue. If it is, we will remove that data from the queue, upload it back to the memory store, and send a response. Now, we will fire the leave event when a player leaves the game, just in case a player joins the queue and leaves the game pathetically. We will also remove players from the queue when the server is about to shut down. Finally, our system is complete. But before testing, we need to do a few things. First, make the game public. Turn on HTTP requests and third-party teleport. Now, publish the game. Also, let's go to World 1 and change the color of the baseplate. At last, we can test our game. However, there is a problem because we can't use Roblox multi-instance to run multiple accounts on the same device and run this system for some reason. If we try to do so, only one account will get teleported, but the other account will encounter error 773, attempted to teleport to a place that is restricted. So, we need to use different devices for each account. I will use my phone for the other account and give it a try. As we can see, it works. If you are still concerned, you can always test it yourself. Link is in the description. We have finished our journey here today. Hopefully, you have learned something from this video. Liking and subscribing are highly appreciated. If you still have lingering questions about anything, leave them in the comment section, and I will try my best to answer. Peace out.